All right. Good morning, everyone. I'm incredibly excited to be here with you all. My name is Phil Wynn, and I'm the National Partnerships Manager for K-12 Inc. and K-12 Learning Solutions. I have my colleague Mike Darderis here. He's the Senior Director of College and Career Readiness, and he'll share his narrative in a bit. A little bit more about myself. So I was a former educator. I was a campus administrator and director at the school district level. And then I headed into some entrepreneurial ventures, and I founded Ed Chiefs, and now I'm here at K-12 slash Drive Inc. Quick agenda overview for today. So we'll do some team introductions later on. I'll dive into some context around K-12 learning solutions in general. Mike will take it over with Destinations Career Academy and the narrative and impact there. And then I'm gonna do some DCA knowledge share and then we'll end with a QA. and a So a little bit more about K-12. K-12 has been around for 20 plus years. We've supported over a million students and counting. We're the largest network of K-12 certified online teachers with over about 10,000 now that data point has changed. And we partnered with over about 3,000 school districts in all 50 states. As you know, I wanted to provide some overview and context of our changing world, right? As our school and education experience is now navigating the nuances and the ups and downs and ebbs and flows of the pandemic, I wanted to highlight a few data points um, here and how K-12 has responded to the pandemic itself. So as we know, 98% of our schools and students have experienced a drastic change in their educational experience. Now, the other 3% who are in those virtual schools here at K-12 um, and other providers, they have not, right? They've gone uh, business as usual, as we would say. And what we found, we partnered with USA Today and we've gathered some additional insights and data and we found that over 60% of parents are seeking alternative options for their students to have a seamless educational experience. Now what that has caused is our enrollment numbers have had an incredible high uptick, which has caused our wait lists, right, to be incredibly robust. Now we have stepped back and we've named explicitly, you know what, we want to make sure that we're partnering with our schools, we were partnering with our districts to retain our students and families in-house at their districts. So what we've done is provided our solutions that we'll explore deeper today. Before we dive into our conversation a little bit more, I do wanna highlight a couple accolades um, and awards that we've seen across the years for our learning solutions. So all the way from pre-K to 12th grade, here are the different categories and the bullets here denotes uh, the awards that we received in all these categories. Now, as you can see here, our learning solutions are incredibly robust. So we do offer our core curriculum, supplemental items. We offer our electives. Today, we're going to focus on that career readiness piece, right? How do we ensure that we're providing CET programming and career pathways in a virtual setting? But we also offer solutions in world languages, literacy, intervention, credit recovery, and summer school. Now, I do want to name that our solutions have also changed, right, as we're navigating the pandemic. Um, so we offer three succinct solutions that are brand new. The first is K-12 On Demand. So we're offering our school and district partners a system that they can turn off and on, right, during those emergency situations. So for an example, some districts have hotspots where they have about two or three schools that need to close down, but they don't want to close down their entire district. So K-12 is offering their learning solutions here to be able to respond immediately and turn that off and on. The second is K-12 Blended. This is wonderful for supporting those school and district partners who are going hybrid in that ABAB model, right? And so we're supporting schools to effectively do that. We're coaching schools up and developing a synchronous and asynchronous models for our schools to be successful. And the third option is what we've seen most during this context is we are supporting school and district partners in launching their full-time virtual academies. What that means, for an example, is if a school district A wants to say, you know what, Phil, we want to provide our students and families with a choice to attend our own virtual um, cyber school, 
we support our school and district partners in doing that. And so we offer our learning solutions, our infrastructure, our content, our training, all the above. So you can have a standalone virtual school at your district. And again, you're retaining your students and families. Now I'm gonna hand it over to Mike Darderis, again, our Senior Director of College and Career Readiness. And he's gonna show you all how we've done this in the virtual setting and brought CTE to life in a virtual school. Awesome, Darderis, I'm gonna turn off my share and you got it. All right, Phil, hopefully you can see my screen up. Oh, there we go, now you can see my screen. Welcome everyone and, and thanks for joining us and, and uh, spending some time with Phil and I talking about career readiness at K-12 and beyond. Uh, my name is Mike Dardaris. I am the Senior Director of Career Readiness at K-12. Been here for about 18 months, so it's been a bit of a change for me. I was the former founding principal at HFM P-TECH, uh, which is the Pathways in Technology Early College High School um, in upstate New York, central New York. Um, and today I'm honored to talk to you about the innovation uh, that I encountered uh, as a small group of educators in New York State tried to disrupt the status quo in education in New York um, and how we are taking the lessons that we learned at P-TECH and we're applying them nationally to remove uh, and most importantly remove barriers and level the playing field for children across the U.S. And essentially that's, that's actually in my contract with K-12. That's, that's why I'm here. Uh, I don't believe that our zip codes or our last names or our circumstances should determine um, our future and the future of our children. So putting my efforts, I guess, where my mouth is, we've developed an innovative career readiness program based on career clusters um, where students choose a pathway, take pathway specific courses um, that all culminate in an industry recognized certification. We embrace the social engagement aspect, it's so important, of career learning through career and technical student organizations and project-based learning. And the focus of this presentation is really going to bridge um, the learnings from the Pathways in Technology Early College High School that I'm going to talk about here um, into this national program uh, through K-12. So at P-TECH, very interesting school. And again, I'm happy to talk more about this with anybody uh, at the end or even share my contact information. But P-TECH is a New York State, it's a school where students pursue a New York State Regents Diploma and their Associate's Degree at the same time through the P-TECH programs while attending classes um, at their little school in Johnstown, New York, and their partner college, Fulton Montgomery Community College. So students were actually freshmen in high school and freshmen in college at the exact same time. P-TECH teachers and students focused on group collaboration and hands-on learning or project-based learning. Students are expected to take uh, their lead role in their education, a significant amount of choice while choosing their pathways to their careers and, and taking college level credit bearing courses um, starting in their first year, uh, which was ninth grade at P-TECH. We were selected as one of the 25 most innovative high schools in America. Um, from the American Association of School Administrators and the Successful Practices Network in 2018, and in 2016 selected as a model school by the International Center for Leadership. So 100% of the students at P-TECH were labeled at risk, and we could have a whole hour session based on what at risk means, but you know, think about it uh, from the state's perspective, all those boxes are checked. Um, so the New York State set the standards uh, for what at risk meant, but you can imagine, it's homelessness, it's economic um, challenges, it's, it's students first generation college going, ethnic minority, it's students that uh, are underrepresented in college and careers. Um, in 2018, 100% of our students received free, free lunch, 21% of our students had an IEP or, or a 504 plan, and uh, about a quarter of the PTAC student population was identified as ethnic or racial minority, 50% of the P-TECH students um, were first generation uh, college going or the first generation in their family to go to college. And a portion of the HFM P-TECH student body is from a small city environment called Amsterdam, while another portion of the student population is from an extremely isolated rural environment um, with very few community resources. So we all came together um, from 15 different school districts to this one little school. 
about 50 students a year were allowed in. Um, and PTAC was paperless and wireless. Every student got a one-to-one -one MacBook Air and they took it home every day with them. There are no textbooks, no, no desks, no rows, no bells, no lockers. We were really trying to reimagine education in every way. Um, there was a robotics lab and an underwater robot robotics lab, however, and in every classroom, which we renamed Innovation Spaces, um, each one of those was designed after the modern office space. Um, think Google. Um, and we tried to, to base everything we were doing on, on those innovative, innovative collaborative spaces. Every aspect of PTAC was student run. In fact, the students designed the makerspace and prototype labs. Students in this model had outperformed New York State in every measurable category. In 2017, students achieved a 92% college course pass rate, outperforming their traditional college student colleagues. Um, most recently in March, six PTEC juniors were named to the College Honor Society, requiring a 3.5 GPA and a full-time course load. This is all while maintaining their high school course load. Remember, these students were labeled, quote unquote, at risk, were some of the most underperforming students at the local high schools. Um, PTAC enjoys a 92% high school graduation rate, and students that are not ready to graduate continue on to their pathway in college courses for up to six years. This program is paid for, um, so it's it's free to the student. Um, of I like to say of no cost. However, it's not free because there's a lot of blood, sweat, and tears that goes in, into uh, being a student there. 28% uh, of the inaugural class earned their associate's degree from FMCC while simultaneously earning their high school diploma from their whole homeschool district in four years, their associates and their high school in four years. As a matter of fact, some of those students actually graduated college before high school. Graduates have gone on to some of the top universities such as RIT, College of St. Rose, Siena, Albany, Buffalo, and many others. Um, actually, one of our recent college graduates is actually teaching a recent PTEC graduates is actually teaching at the college and has opened their own business. Um, while one is also serving in the National Guard as a field medic while uh, beginning his pre-med at a local college. Um, current seniors uh, are interning all over the state, number 22 bikes, Mohawk flooring, Gloversville sewing, there's all sorts of small businesses in the area. And I wanna talk to you a little bit about how some of these lessons that we've learned can apply to what we're doing here nationally. Um, Interestingly enough, while I was there, PTEC has never had a single fight or violent incident in a brick and mortar school, as you know, in a high school, that's, that's uh, pretty incredible. Attendance is over 95%. The model had been visited by two commissioners of education, uh, two uh, state university chancellors, congressmen, senators, school superintendents, and, and hundreds of educational leaders from across the nation and all over the world uh, to, to see what we are doing and mostly learn from our mistakes so they can replicate the model and, and do it in their own way. And that's what I'm hoping you you will be able to do today is, is learn a little bit from what we uh, did right and what we did wrong, and then maybe apply it to your model. So the first lesson that we learned at PTEC uh, was about engagement and authentic engagement. I always thought that I was a band teacher be before this, this administration uh, kicked in. Um, that relevance and passion was the most important piece of a, a student's education um, uh, to, to um, inspire. However, that wasn't the case. What I learned that authentic, authenticity was the most important piece. And what you're looking at here is what I call the pyramid of engagement. Relevance is important. Passion and relevance build that foundation. However, authenticity trumps all. I want to tell you a little story uh, about a project that we did that, that describes authenticity. Jim Law was a local CEO of a company called Mohawk Cabinet. And he asked if we could help with a service manual that was going to be used in the pitch for Sam's Club. He was essentially selling uh, this machine that you see here. It's an ice cream machine to Sam's Club. And they wanted, had to go and do their pitch. Um, we're used to working with business partners and collaborating. Um, so we definitely said, yes, we'd love to do that. Unfortunately, what they possessed at Mohawk Cabinet in manufacturing prowess, um, folks at Mohawk Cabinet lacked in 21st century, uh, 21st century marketing and digital skills. Um, I asked Jim if he'd allow my students to have a crack at it um, and uh, create this manual for them. And this was on a Tuesday. And he said, yeah, as long as I can get it back on Monday. 
So uh, panic ensuing, I went back to my kids and I asked for a group of volunteers and I handed them this half typed, uh, half written um, manual, literally typed on a typewriter and said, guys, what can you do with this for me? What, let's take this back to them and, and see what we can do for the fine folks over there at Mohawk Cabinet. So what they did is they jumped in quick. They created a QR code and a sticker, and essentially they stuck the sticker to the side of the ice cream machine. And as you know, a manual, um, manuals uh, are basically get lost. You know, they go on a back shelf someplace. So the folks at Walmart and Sam's Club, they knew that a manual was needed, but they didn't know how to keep track of it. So my kids created a website. And if you're using the machine, all you had to do is take your phone out, scan the QR code, and then it would come up uh, not only in English, but also in Spanish. So it basically showed you how to clean the machine, how to use the machine, um, and, and um, all of the aspects of, of running the machine. Sam's Club wanted to give away free ice cream as people came in because they, they did a study. Hey, if you eat ice cream while you shop, you stay longer. Sounds great. So we pre pre came back to Jim, we presented it to him, and he loved it. Took it to the, to the Sam's Club folks, and, and they loved the way it work, worked. So this was actually uh, kicked off into basically a two years of collaboration between PTAC and the Mohawk Cabinet folks. And when you hear the name Mohawk Cabinet, let me jump back there, what does that make you think of? It made us think of kitchen cabinets and bathroom cabinets and that they, hey, they were cabinet makers. That's not the case. And what we found out going back that in the olden days, ice cream uh, refrigerators and freezers were called cabinets and you'd reach down and literally dip into the cabinets, into the freezers. And what you're looking at here is an old brochure, an old catalog from the original Mohawk cabinet, I think early, early 50s or so, 60s maybe. Um, and really, they have not changed their name or anything since. So our students asked, hey, can we have a crack at this and, and reinvigorate your website, which really wasn't much there. And Jim at uh, Mohawk Cabinets gave us free reign. They said, absolutely, go ahead in and, and, and do as you will. So we took their website. Um, we did some hand drawing of, of having a, a uh, doing some marketing around a um, you see a mascot there on the side and he's holding the, the wrench and the ice cream cone. And we literally changed their name. So we went from Mohawk cabinet, which makes you think of cabinets and hanging kitchen cabinets to frozenparts.com. At least frozen parts was associated with the actual uh, refrigeration business. And then my students created a website because Jim was still distributing all of his parts via catalog hand delivering, mailing them out. And it was only in the continental United States to where the people he had addresses for. So there was no way for people to get in touch with him, order parts, see what he had, um, unless it was through the catalog. Our kids said that was crazy and then built frozenparts.com. They went and took pictures of all the parts that they custom build and make and all the different machines that, that they do. And they, they brought it up online. The students also monetized the website now uh, you can go to frozenparts.com and you literally can order these parts from around the world. So essentially, a group of high school students took a local business, brought them into the 21st century, and then globalized and monetized them in a way um, that they were struggling to get their head around. From there, their uh, orders skyrocketed, and it was actually tough for them to keep up with deliveries and, and uh, had, to, had to scale. This small group of students, and let's let's make sure we remind ourselves that this small group of at-risk students impacted this business in a way that changed their their uh, project uh, projected future. The lesson we learned from there is not only can we do this at a local level, but now we can do this in a national level. So at K-12 in our destinations career academies, and that's what we call our career readiness uh, schools, is not only do we engage with the local uh, business person, uh, such as Mohawk Cabinet, but we engage nationally. For example, um, the, the uh, IUOE Local 139 Training Center, that is the union of heavy equipment operators. Um, we have 
uh, engage in a relationship with them now to teach students the art of using heavy equipment uh, through the union and collaborating with them to train and have pre-apprenticeships for our students to uh, come up through our pathways and then have a paying middle-level career through the apprenticeship of the IUOE, the local union 139 training centers. We're collaborating with organizations such as Salesforce and Cummins, local law offices in, in the National Chamber of Commerce. Um, and we have a national partnership team that helps our schools do that. One of the lessons that we've learned from that is that not only is the skill important, but what our partners, our business partners are telling us is the professional skills are even more important. They're telling us, hey, we can teach these skills. We can teach them the the intricacies and the nuances of the trade. However, coming ready to work, that's hard for us to teach. We don't always connect really well with the new generation or we don't always understand this younger generation coming in. So we need some help with that. So what we're saying is let us help you with that. Let us build these professional skills, teach students how to collaborate, teach students how to ask for help when needed and then forge forward and take a risk and when uh, that when the lesson calls for it there. Um, we're teaching students to be professional and we're teaching students uh, how to solve problems, have uh, productive disagreements, all things that you want to see in your future employees. And not only are we teaching that, but we've developed a rubric so we can assess where they are, intervene, and then help them get to the next phase. The next aspect uh, or lesson uh, that we learned from PTEC was the curriculum. Now, as I had mentioned, PTEC was 100% project-based learning. We knew that the only way to change the model was to start from scratch. We were committed to no books, no bells, no desks, no rows. We are 100% cross-curricular project-based learning with authentic industry partner challenges. Um, there's no, there was no canned solution out there for us. So we had to create it all ourselves. This takes time and time means teacher time. And I don't have a, a team for this. I didn't have a team for this. So the teachers and I did all the work. Um, we had an hour every day set aside where the teachers met as a team uh, to develop projects outside of their independent planning time. As you know, as an administrator or a coordinator or a teacher, that's a lot of daily time. Um, in, the, in addition to the individual planning time, we worked together uh, on this curriculum work. And that was very difficult for us because it took a lot of time and resources for us. So when we got to K-12 and developed the Destinations Career Academy, we said, we're going to create courses that are a scaffold, that have a scaffold built in so teachers don't have to do this foundational work and they can focus on the things they need to focus on, which is teaching, delivering inspired instruction, being coaches and cheerleaders. So when I was brought on board, we were focused on creating these courses that had that scaffolding built in. If a teacher wanted to add, change the project or add an authentic business partner, they had the flexibility. But a new teacher, somebody brand new to project-based learning, could come in and use the scaffolding that is already built into the courses. Very much different than a textbook. The textbook uh, is static, right? It doesn't change. This is a framework. These courses um, established the content and then the teacher, when they feel comfortable, can start to build out. And we use um, project-based learning coaches that meet, meets with each one of our teachers, help them learn the art of project-based learning and learn how to use PBL to create relationships with their students. The next lesson I learned at PTEC was flexibility. And, and this was a tough lesson. We had to create a master schedule for not only high school, but also for that fit the college, right? Our, our kids went to the high school, our local high school, our, our PTAC high school, and we're students at the college. And if you are familiar with working with a college, they are not flexible to the high school schedule. Their schedule is what it is. So we had to build everything, our master schedule around that. That was very challenging and very difficult. And what it did was forced us uh, to make some very difficult decisions about things we could offer, electives we could offer, personnel, timing. It was it was a significant challenge that we had a difficult time solving. Coming to K-12, being blended and being virtual meant that students could have internships. Students could 
um, have mentorships. Students could take college courses directly from the college or a blended course because the schedule was flexible. That means they could do synchronous and asynchronous learning on their own time based around the important piece of um, an internship or a mentorship. So important. I wish I'd had that uh, a couple years ago. So coming in, we thought that, hey, this was very important to build flexible scheduling and flexible coursework where students could do it in a blended way, still be hands on, still be in the industry and in the field, but then take the content courses um, in a way and in a speed or at a pace that was appropriate for them. The next lesson I'd like to talk about was instruction. And as you know, uh, instruction is the most important uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I jumped ahead of myself. So the next lesson I want to talk about is student organizations and the engagement that we're finding in our student organizations. So at P-TECH, we had underwater robotics. Um, we also had FBLA, Future Business Leaders of America. So the students either flowed into this, this robotics um, program, which, hey, I guess uh, terrestrial robotics was too easy, so we had to do everything underwater. So we, we went that way. It was an amazing experience, extremely challenging, not for everybody. As a matter of fact, it was a small group of kids. Future Business Leaders of America is an amazing organization. And really, I feel every child should have that foundational business um, uh, framework. It teaches you about the way the economy works, marketing, uh, finances, all of those things. The lesson we learned was that these were very engaging. However, our, not all students fit. What we learned and what we applied here at, at the Destinations Career Academy at K-12 was we have to offer it for every pathway. So now we're offering DECA for the marketing and business kids. We're offer, offering um, HOSA for our health um, occupations students. We're offering the um, TSA, the Technology Student Association for um, the IT kids and the STEM students. So all students have a place to go where they are with students of the same mindset and same passion, but they can also socialize and engage around these hands-on technical skills and practice them. Um, get rid of my note there. As And practice them together with students um, from around uh, their state and from around the country. We took that idea and then we, we, we started to expand it. Like, okay, if this is what students are loving and we're finding through some of our polls that, hey, our kids love this kind of connection with other students and with their content, we need to expand it. So what are we doing now? Esports, just like Friday Night Lights, um, at a Destinations Career Academy, our academies now have esports and they have an inter K-12 uh, league in, in several different games that they're playing to compete against. And also students are participating in, in local leagues, we'll call it uh, cross league leagues. Um, and as you know, or may have heard, students can now get scholarships and attend universities just like uh, a regular um, sport, field sport or individual sport. It's pretty amazing. So we're developing that. And also one of our newest uh, developments is music. Students are able to join, and it's in a pilot phase now, but they're able to join uh, a band uh, with six other students and perform synchronously, that means live, while they're in their home and with other students being coached up by um, what we're calling the Rock and Roll Academy, um, by a member of the Rock and Roll Academy staff and uh, coaching these bands while they're playing together live. And if you know anything about synchronous performance, Internet latency, it makes that impossible. Well, we figured that out. So our students are ab actually able to get in, rehearse, and perform in a, in a live, synchronous manner, not pasting and cutting things together, but they're performing live. And it's pretty amazing. So we're watching this grow, keeping an eye on it very closely. The next lesson is instruction. And this was the most important piece because, as you know, the most important uh, factor in a student's uh, educational pathway is a caring an adult, right? It's an, a caring adult. It's that relationship. Project-based learning was the conduit for that. The most powerful thing about PBL was teachers were able to become the coach. Um, they were the cheerleader. They were uh, the person setting out the map, the navigator. They were laying the breadcrumbs out. However, they weren't the holder of the content. They weren't the all-knowing. They were the guide, um, and they were the ones giving the pep talks, but also allowed students to, to learn on their own and in their own pace. 
which ended always ended in a public display of knowledge. Now, what you're seeing here is we had a couple different projects. Um, the, the young man down there on the on the right with the computer and pointing to the um, display. That that uh, young man uh, is doing. Uh, he's at a hospital and he's just talking about his cancer awareness fair that he's offering. The other students. Um, that you see we're doing a CSI crime scene investigation and it was combined with a math and a science um, lessons or units where students um, actually had to do uh, the DNA analysis and then the triangulation of the blood spatter. Everything, don't worry, everything you see there is fake and no, no teachers or administrators were harmed in the making of that. But what we learned was we were on an island and essentially everything we did outside um, in, in involving PBL, we had to develop through our instructional coach and collaboration. It was very, very difficult. And we spent a significant amount of time doing that. So here at K-12 and through the Destinations Career Academy, we're providing, as we discussed earlier, the scaffolding to coach our teachers, whether they're a first time PBL teacher or an experienced veteran, we're meeting them where they're at. And you know that's a best practice for kids, but it's also a best practice for teachers. We're meeting them where they're at in these national PLCs, uh, professional learning communities, and we're helping them grow as an instructional specialist. So we are, um, as you know, helping our teachers make the shift from the keeper of content, right, which is a big shift, to the facilitator of learning. And that's very easy to say and very difficult to do. So it's very important that we help them uh, understand the benefits of PBL, um, help them create and, and engage in these hands-on uh, augmented reality, interactive uh, PBL lessons that are embedded in the actual courses. And what you're looking at here is, is some of the actual projects um, that we have embedded, but then take that and expand on it in an artful way where they might be more authentic to the local students in the state or even in the area, collaborating with partners in, a, in an actual authentic project that has implication to the business partner and is authentic to the student. Uh, and that was the learning that we, that we took away from there. And then finally uh, was the collaboration and how we're collaborating. And not just student to student collaboration, but collaboration with our business mentors, our business partners. And at PTAC, we had amazing partners. What you, what you see here is, is our local business partners who take time out of their day to come and meet with our students. Um, we call them Workforce Wednesdays and Third Thursday series. They would come in and, and talk about everything from how to do an interview, how to create a resume, how to set an appropriate email, to interviewing skills, but also industry specific skills that, that are needed um, and, and are, are uh, used um, in those industry specific pathways and the students that are in those pathways uh, could develop and, and harness those skills that maybe they'd have to wait till they were in actually in the industry to find out. It was also a way for them to create a network and have a trusted adult that was in that industry. They could call in and say, hey, I'm, I'm looking at applying to MBT Bank. What are your thoughts? Or, you know, I'm thinking about instead of going into um, electronic engineering, I'm thinking to do coding instead and, and work with, what do you think about that? And they can get advice from somebody other than the teacher or the, the counselor at the school, which is, again, authentic and impactful for the, for the student. However, this was limited. It only happened a couple times a month and it was taxing on the business partner because they had to leave the business. And as you know, time is money for a business partner, especially a small business owner. So they had to leave their place of business, take an hour or two out um, to spend time with their kids at, the, at PTAC. What we've done is tried to eliminate uh, the barriers and we're using some 21st century uh, tools um, such as Nepris and uh, Tallow and Microsoft Teams. So Nepris provides a bridge between our students and the real world professions. It's an online platform and essentially there are four ways teachers can leverage Nepris. There's the daily virtual chat where you can have their class join the sessions. The full class can join in and, and listen to an industry expert talk. Um, there's teachers can either have their class join it live or they can have a recording and, and students can watch it later. 
Um, also, teachers can request a guest speaker, and this is all done virtually, so the, the, the speaker never has to leave their place of work. They just go into their desk, they turn on their computer, and then they, they join them very much the way we're doing now. Um, students can also ask questions such as salary information, right? They're always, they always want to know um, what, the, what the potential earning potential is, and they can ask all sorts of questions. The other um, collaboration tool uh, that we used, and I'm going to skip through here, sorry about that, was Tallo. Tallo is like LinkedIn for uh, high school students and college students. Uh, LinkedIn is important because it establishes a professional network um, of like-minded people in specific business and professional areas. That's what Tallo does for students. Um, however, it's a closed micro network, which means there's the chat isn't happening back and forth um, uh, outside agencies or, or non-approved businesses can't reach out and connect with students. So it's a safe network for students to go ahead and, and uh, develop their talent profile online. So colleges and companies and different organizations could uh, share their information to students who might have interest in those certain pathways or certain uh, assets or opportunities. And those students can opt in or not determining, you know, hey, I want to be connected to by colleges or I want businesses who have internships to be able to reach out to me. They can build their profile and then open up the ability for businesses to reach out to them. And that's a great way to start establishing um, a professional network for students. It's also a great way for counselors to help students build their profile, but also build um, their trajectory into college or the career by using Tallow, by establishing and communicating with the child about, hey, what do you want to do in the future? What are your areas of interest and what have you already done that we can post on here to demonstrate um, your skills? Additionally, Microsoft Teams, and if you work in the business world, you know that Microsoft Teams such a, and things such as Slack or, or other um, uh, platforms are used to communicate. Um, our students use Microsoft Teams in their project-based learning, and they use this to share documents. They use it to communicate. They use it to, for face-to-face, -face, for planning, um, but they also are getting used to using a platform uh, to collaborate. And through Microsoft Teams, um, we uh, students are, are able to work live and um, asynchronously. Uh, it's typically monitored by the teacher, so um, the professionalism and the professional skills can be um, applauded or also be intervened. There's, there's video chat and file chat sharing, as I mentioned, as well. So um, I'd like to thank you. Uh, for for listening, and uh, at this time, I'm going to turn it back over uh, to Phil and open it up. If there's any questions, I'm I'm happy to talk about that, and I'm happy to talk about Destinations Career Academies and what we're doing in the virtual space and the blended space, as well as the uh, the learnings that I that I took away from PTAC. So thank you so much, and Phil. Wonderful, Mike, and thank you so much for sharing your narrative and and team. Thank you so much for being with us. Today, I do want to name, so Mike is an award, a national recognized um, principal administrator, and he's leveraged all of his experiences at P-Tech to inform our model here at K-12 and Destinations Career Academy. And so as you can see here, Mike's vision has expanded nationally. So we have schools, virtual CTE schools across the nation, as you can see marked here on um, the map. And I want to dive in into exactly what DCA is, right? What does that look like now in context? What does this virtual CTE school look like? And so students, when they engage in our schools, they're selecting their, their own pathways to go on, right? To become certified, to leave our school with additional industry certifications and experiences to be more in, competitive in the workspace. 
and in post-secondary education. So for an example, if a scholar says, I am interested in IT, they will go on a pathway throughout their time at DCA to earn these certifications and experiences, right? So our students can potentially leave with a game and design and programming certification or a networking and cybersecurity certification and have those credentials in IT as they leave our schools. Other students who are interested in health and human services can ensure that they're getting certifications that are aligned with CNA or dental assisting. Another pathway is business administration. A lot of students love that, that general marketing and entrepreneurship. Manufacturing and trades is also a big one where students want to explore and engage in credentialing and engineering. And then we also have pathways in agriculture, food, and natural sciences as well. Just wanted to show you all just a quick scope and sequence of what this looks like for a student. And so here is the advanced manufacturing pathway. So in ninth grade, the student has their core courses, right, either asynchronous and synchronous. And then here are the two courses that they would take to lead towards certification. Now, what's really wonderful is that our students are also receiving the additional supports to get them ready for that certification assessment. Right. And so you can see here, these are the courses that they would take along the way from ninth all the way to 12th grade. Here are the certifications and the potential jobs that they could apply for um, and enter as they leave our schools at DCA. Now, Mike had highlighted this earlier, but this is Tallow. Again, it's a really wonderful way for our students to interact with business partners to really amp up their uh, profile and their career readiness. Here it shows their GPA, all the certifications that they've received through DCA as well, um, all their engagements, their SAT scores, and so on. Now, I know that that was a lot of information. We've just been talking uh, to you all and a lot of content here, but would love to hear your thoughts, reflections, feedback, or questions. You are able to bring the DCA program to your school, if that's something you're interested in as well, so your students can uh, receive those industry certifications, experience this in a virtual context, and then are able to be more competitive than ever as they enter uh, either post-secondary education or the workforce. So I'm going to open this time for questions. You all can put them in the chat here as well, or we can just come off um, mute and talk with us directly. I see a quick question here. Do you have highly qualified teachers for each of these career pathways? What about their core classes? Absolutely. And so the states in which we are existing right now and the national map, we do have certified uh, teachers in each one of those course pathways for our students. Um, what about their core classes? We also offer um, the virtual courses in our K-12 learning solution. So if you want to go full-time virtual, then we do offer the full-time courses and the CTE courses to adopt under your name. So for example, Jen, if it was ACE Academy, then you would have the ACE Academy uh, CTE school under your name in a virtual context, and they'll get the core content and they'll get the pathways um, to become certified as well. Any other questions here? Darren, thank you so much for, for your feedback there. Same as Jose. Do you have a link where we can uh, do some exploring for DCA? Absolutely. I will make sure to drop that in the chat right now. Awesome, what else team? And as a former educator, I love the wait time, so. All right, Mike, do you have any additional ads or reflections or thoughts to, to add before we head out today? 
Uh, no, I, th I, th I think that's, that's uh, we covered just about everything. I, I did pop my email in there. I think everybody can see it, um, uh, I hope. Uh, so hopefully if anybody has any questions and wants to talk uh, more about Destinations Career Academy specific career readiness, um, feel free to reach out to Phil and I. We work uh, together tandemly um, very often and would be happy to sit and, and just talk in general um, and just talk about your program and hear about your program. This feels very one way. Um, but if you wanted to learn more specifically, um, we'd also uh, be happy to talk about that as well. But I, I just want to say thank you for, for having us here. Thanks. Thank you so much, everybody. And I also dropped my personal email there. We wanted to provide you all with our direct emails, our personal ones, just so we could have this authentic conversation, right, moving forward. So again, if you want to bring DCA to your schools as we're navigating this virtual context, as we're trying to figure out how to do CTE in a virtual world, uh, please reach out to us. We'd love to chat.